Okay, we're going to get started. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar. You can be a Kubernetes contributor too. I'm Jerry Fallon and I will be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Jeremy L. Morris, software engineer at DigitalOcean. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or the questions that are in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. And please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeremy for today's presentation. Hey everyone, thank you uh, for coming to today's webinar. My name is Jeremy Morris. I'm a software engineer at DigitalOcean. I currently work on the team that maintains uh, DigitalOcean's managed Kubernetes solution. I also contribute to Kubernetes and I'm a co-maintainer of a few sub-projects um, within Kubernetes, DigitalOcean Cluster API Provider and DigitalOcean's Cluster Autoscaler. I'm also currently a shadow on the enhancements team for the Kubernetes 1.20 release. And today I hope to uh, show you how you can be a contributor too. So why should you contribute? Uh, from my first commit, which or my first contribution, which was about two years ago at this point, I feel like the experience that I've gotten um, in terms of developing my skills as a software engineer has increased uh, dramatically since then. I've also had the opportunity to work um, on a complex code base, you know, experience working with distributed teams in different time zones. Also got some experience with project management and planning. Uh, for example, as a shadow, uh, my responsibility is tracking down um, and following up on the completion of Kubernetes enhancement proposals and making sure they get into the 1.20 milestone. All of this is real experience that can translate to a real software engineering job. Um, I think the experience that you get from contributing to Kubernetes uh, can definitely help your personal and your career growth. Another reason is, you know, of course, it's mutually beneficial. Not only does Kubernetes get, you know, a lot of new contributors that can help, you know, push their project along, but you're also getting the exposure to the community and all the, the brilliant engineers that work on Kubernetes. Um, you also get to benefit from, you know, developing your collaboration and teamwork skills because at the end of the day, you know, when you work on an open source project, you have to learn how to collaborate uh, to be effective. Another reason is that there's tons of work, but not enough contributors. You know, when, when you try to build software that is supposed to solve a uh, diverse set of problems for uh, diverse groups of people, you know, Kubernetes is used throughout the world. It only makes sense that the contributors are also coming from a diverse background. Um, you want those different perspectives. So it's in Kubernetes benefit to include more people and be more inclusive. There's also a lot of uh, problems to solve. I listed a few links here, and these are just uh, the projects that I've contributed myself, contributed to myself. And people that might not know this, but there's uh, Kubernetes the organization within GitHub. But within, within that, there's a bunch of projects, not just Kubernetes core, which I'm sure um, everyone here might be familiar with. But there's all, also like test infra, enhancements, the website for Kubernetes IO, also the sub project that I co-maintain, which is a part of Kubernetes six, another organization which uh, exists kind of alongside Kubernetes, but relates to projects that have to do with the different six. So there's a lot of work uh, is available for people to work on. And I'm sure, you know, if you're interested in contributing to Kubernetes, you can definitely find something that you're interested in. So how do you get started contributing as a, a beginner? I feel like when people want to contribute to Kubernetes, there's this kind of like a perceived high barrier of entry. You know, there's so much work and it's so big, you're not sure exactly where to start. My recommendation to start out with, and I found this useful myself, is to find an area of Kubernetes that you're interested in. Um, there's this concept of SIGs, which is a special interest group, and different parts of Kubernetes uh, we'll have a SIG that kind of governs that, that sub-project or area. So for example, there's SIG networking, SIG testing, 
um, say cloud provider, you kind of just have to, you know, narrow down what interests you and just, you know, follow up with the SIG and make sure you get acquainted with it. You can do this by joining the Slack channel. Every SIG has a corresponding Slack channel. Try to attend some of the meetings and um, just try to be a part of those discussions so you can figure out um, what exactly it is, you know, you can work on. So at the end of the day, you know, SIGs love new contributors because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, you know, if you let them know they're interested in contributing, they will definitely find work for you. Another thing that uh, I found useful, useful is, you know, once you find out a SIG that you're interested in, or even if you don't, you can take advantage of GitHub's uh, label filter. And uh, what a lot of the Kubernetes maintainers will do is they'll label uh, good first issues for issues that are, you know, ready to be picked up by a new contributor or a beginner. So simply filtering on good first issues, you already, you've already narrowed it down to a bunch of issues that, you know, you can get started on or people will be willing to help you out with. Um, and, and then another uh, way to find issues that I kind of find out, uh, found out recently is uh, testgrid.case.io. And this is uh, a way that they track the automatic tests that are run against the PRs. And you can get a good view of what's like flaky in terms of testing. And then you can either find an issue that's already tracking it, or you can make an issue yourself if there isn't one currently tracking uh, those flaky tests. And then you can hunt down whatever is causing that and solve it. Um, it's not the, the easiest thing to do, in my opinion, to, to find issues that way. But it's possible if you're not able to find anything in the existing issues tab, you can always look at, you know, the flaky tests because there's, there's quite a bit of them, but um, there's definitely an active uh, effort to, you know, hunt down those flaky tests. So if you can help contribute to that, people would be really greatly, uh, greatly appreciate that. Another thing is um, it's important to communi communicate. So, you know, from the start, when you're interested in contributing, communicate that, you know, if you join the SIG channel and you just, you know, let them know politely that, hey, I'm a new contributor, I like to get started. Um, is there any work that you can point me to to get started on? To even, you know, once you get assigned a task, communicating the issues you're having, or maybe your availability um, has changed since you last accepted to take on an issue and you're not able to work on it as much anymore. I think it's just important to over communicate because, you know, no one's going to judge you for the time that you put into the, the work that you're doing or if you're not able to solve something because you know everyone has to start somewhere and kubernetes is really complex um people really but people will really appreciate it if you just communicate anything that's going on with the ticket um because you know it's a team effort so you want to just work together and get it done um building relationships i don't think i could have gotten as far as i have uh in terms of you know, now be, being a Kubernetes member and a co-maintainer of some sub-projects without actually building relationships. Uh, a lot of people have helped me along the way uh, in terms of finding issues, um, you know, even the opportunity to co-maintain a sub-project that was brought to me. So things like that uh, will pop up more and more as you build rapport with different members. Another thing that uh, I got to take advantage of was the, the Linux Foundation's Diversity Scholarship. People might not know about this, but, um, you know, the Linux Foundation has a bunch of scholarships for different conferences and KubeCon in 2017, this is what you see pictured here. That's a conference that I got to go to because of the diversity scholarship. And, you know, it's usually for people um, from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, you know, maybe your company also, you know, can't provide, uh, you know, a stipend or anything for you to go, or maybe you're a student, you know, have the, the funds to be able to go to a conference the diversity scholarship allows you to get that experience. And, you know, if, if you're able to, uh, you know, qualify for the scholarship, definitely apply because, you know, when I was first looking at Kubernetes, I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but I didn't get a lot of opportunity to like do a lot with it or um, contribute. But once I went to the conference, learned more about it and met um, different people, attended some of the, the break off meetings for different SIGs and just just learning and talking to people in person about Kubernetes and what it means to be a contributor, it really kind of pushed me and, uh, you know, gave me the courage to, you know, go further into the community and become more involved. Um, also, I think that something that has been useful for me is just to be open to working on new things. Not only does it build rapport with um, the people that you're 
you're working with um, and, and different members, but it also could lead to potential uh, mentorship or sponsors for when you do decide to apply to become a member, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So how do you become a member? Well, let's start by talking about what exactly is a Kubernetes member. So, you know, there's the, there's the status of contributor, which anyone can get just by making at, le at least one PR to uh, Kubernetes. So, um, you know, just once you make your first PR, you'll be labeled a member, I mean, a contributor, you'll see that label next to your name whenever you work on stuff. To become a member, you have to be an active contributor in the community. Um, so this means, you know, you're contributing fairly often, you've uh, built rapport with some people and have been active in a few SIGs. And, you know, you also need to be sponsored by two uh, active members as well. So people who are, have reviewer status. And that's what I was talking about earlier on when, you know, being open to taking on new tasks. I think uh, the people that decided to sponsor me agreed to do so or offered to do so actually because I was always, you know, willing to take on the work that they presented me. I showed them that I was like hungry to contribute and I wanted to, you know, grow myself as a Kubernetes contributor. So they kept helping to facilitate that and provide uh, more things for me to work on. And then uh, eventually agreeing to sponsor me. The, the next uh, member status, I guess you can call it, is reviewer. And that's someone who is reviewing a bunch of contributions within a sub project and they've contributed quite a bit and they're getting pretty experienced within that sub project. And then finally, there's maintainer and that person has the ability to, you know, approve or, you know, say looks good to me on uh, contributions. And they're pretty experienced at this point and they've been actively reviewing um, in a sub project and they also contribute quite a bit. Another tip for uh, becoming a member, uh, you see here pictured is um, a bunch of my contributions up until I got my membership in December. And it's, it's relatively consistent. You know, I, I try to, I would try to contribute every month. Sometimes it'd be multiple times a month. Sometimes I would skip a month and then pick it up again. But you have to remember just to contribute at your own pace. And when I say consistent, I mean, you know, you're actively and consistently asking uh, for work or finding work to do, and then you're, you're finishing it till completion. And then, you know, what I did aim to do was to increase my scope as I contribute more and more. So, you know, you don't want to contribute. It's good to do those, like, for example, typo fixes and things in the beginning. But I think that if, uh, you know, you want to apply, become a member, you, you just up the significance of your contributions over time to be a little more complex. And it's also so that you get more familiarity with the code base or the sub project, because eventually the hopes is that you'll become a reviewer and maintainer. So uh, try to keep those things in mind when, if, if your goal is to become a member. And then also trying to have some familiarity with at least two areas of the code. By areas, it could just mean like SIGs and the sub projects under those SIGs. For me, I worked with uh, SIG testing and SIG Cloud Provider. And uh, I was able to get uh, a, a member from each of those SIGs to sponsor me um, just by doing a lot of work with them. So the membership application itself, that's probably the uh, simplest part of the whole process. You know, obviously putting in the time and, and contributing up until that point, it's gonna take most of the work. The application is really just you know, there's an issue template uh, within the Kubernetes org repo that uh, lets you fill it out. Basically, it's a, a template for filling out a membership. And you just put in all the links to PRs, contributions, um, in, ter in terms of like comments or uh, reviews, you know, participating in any issue. Yeah, anywhere where you participated or contributed in some way, you, you kind of link that stuff and there's sections for that. And then also the SIG projects that you're involved with. And as you can see here, it's SIG testing, it's SIG cloud provider. And then uh, you know, Alejandro, that's Jorge, he's from SIG testing. Um, he offered to sponsor me and I worked on a bunch of SIG testing stuff with him. And then Andrew Sai Kim is a uh, co-chair for uh, SIG cloud provider. And also I worked with him quite a bit. So typically your sponsors should be someone that you've worked with pretty closely on things and they have a familiarity and can vouch for your work. Oh, and one more thing about the application, 
once once they like plus one it and you know basically agree that they did say they're going to sponsor you it only takes like a day or two i think until like a, a bot and then another kubernetes member like approves it and then i think i make they make a pr to make it official and then you receive a github email asking if you would like to join the kubernetes organization in github and then you get uh, a little kubernetes logo next to your your uh naming your profile. So that's pretty cool, I guess. Another thing um, to point out is like what you may find difficult along the way, you know, try not to let these things discourage you too much. Cause I know when I was working through these things, it was pretty tough. You know, one of them being testing, um, especially in the beginning, I feel like trying to figure out how to test my PRs locally. was like took longer than the actual PR. And um, I just think it was a little tough because of the documentation layout, you know, some of the stuff is, you know, documented, doc documented in multiple places and kind of contradicting, you know, so for example, uh, I'll put these links here, but like running end to end tests with Bazel, and um, that's the, I believe that's the hack E2E director where these tests are run, if I'm not mistaken, and then running into e tests with uh, Ginkgo that they both say in the documentation that these are the canonical ways to run tests. But, you know, I, I guess if it's canonical, there should be only one. So that, that was a little confusing. And then if you talk to different people, you know, everyone has their own way of testing things locally. So I, I think that that personally for me was pretty tough. So I'd recommend, you know, if you're having trouble with this, just try to find someone uh, that's already a Kubernetes member and has experience with testing a lot, uh, their PRs locally a lot or at the least just reach out to the SIG testing channel. You know, they're super helpful and, and can point you in the right direction. Just make sure to be detailed with your question and um, you know, someone will definitely get back to you. Also, um, getting feedback is pretty tough. You know, I, I remember, especially in the beginning, and I see this for people who are new contributors still, uh, it's tough getting people to review your stuff I think this also goes with uh, the communication and the building relationships aspect of being a beginner. You have to kind of, I think there's like a, a level of trust, you know, once you contributed enough and you know, if people know about you and, and seeing your work or reviewed in the past, they're more willing to review it again. But if you're brand new, you know, they're not sure if it's just a, a drive by PR or someone just trying to stick something in or if a lot of thought was put into it or not. I think uh, this can be mitigated a bit by maybe participating in some of the, the SIG, the related SIGs meetings. Like for example, if it's a PR pertaining to SIG Cloud Provider, try to go to a SIG Cloud Provider meeting or two and you know, present your idea or PR that you wanna make or bring up any questions that you have. You know, Again, everyone's really inclusive and they want more people to be a part of uh, stuff they're working on. So, you know, usually these meetings will have times for you to, for new contributors to talk or bring up any issues they're having or any PRs they need to have reviewed. And um, if all else fails, you can um, simply DM the issue creator in Slack. So whoever made the issue, you know, just go check them on in Slack and send them a DM and remember to have empathy and patience. Always keep this in mind with, when working with people in Kubernetes because a lot of people that I might have to reach out to are like super busy and juggling a bunch of things. And in my experience, they, they tend to get back to me some later than others. There's no ill will or there's no, uh, they're not trying to ignore you on purpose. They're usually just super busy. And usually what happens is they end up being apologetic and saying, sorry, Jeremy, that I, I responded to you a little late. I was busy doing, you know, X and Y, um, here's your answer. So I you know, just have a little empathy and patience. Um, and then finding work, as I addressed earlier, there's a high barrier uh, to entry to get into contributing. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's most likely due to, due to the uh, analysis paralysis um, type situation. And that, that's how I feel, that's what I feel like got me stuck in the beginning, was just trying to find something to get started on. So eventually I just started uh, you know, just started taking things when they would come up. So opportunities to, to work on things. I think that you just kind of gotta get started, you know, either pick an issue or reach out to someone and then work with them on, on doing tasks and 
try not to be picky. You know, it's okay to be picky, but if you really want to contribute and get started and you're having trouble finding issues, just, you know, take work off people's hands. You know, everyone really appreciates that. And then the cooler things will come down the line uh, later on as you, you know, build that rapport and build that confidence in your work. And last but not least, work-life balance. I think that uh, this is pretty tough for me in the past and still kind of is. I'm not sure that anyone has, you know, cracked the code to that in terms of, you know, balancing work, family obligations, and then contributing in your spare time. It's pretty tough, especially if you work at a company that doesn't necessarily have a whole budget or department dedicated to open source um, full time. You know, it, it, it does get a little tough. So I think, you know, communicating with your manager if you want to, uh, you know, get some open source work into your uh, day job. Also, try to be deliberate about your schedule. So if you, you know, with family obligations and things like that, try to like, you know, slot time out. If you can only do it on the weekends or at nights, it's fine. Just try to make sure you have a set time that you dedicate to open source work and don't deviate too much from it because then you start sacrificing other things. And yeah, you know, just find what works with you. There's no pressure to contribute a certain amount of time. Everyone's different, um, has different obligations and responsibilities. Just do what's best for you. Takeaways, um, you know, anyone can contribute. I think that's important to remind yourself. You don't have to be, uh, you know, at the biggest tech company, the, you know, the best engineer in the world or anything like that, or to be popular, that doesn't even matter. I, I've seen a lot of contributors from, you know, super small startups. I never heard of them before I met them uh, within the community, but they're like excellent engineers. So I don't think anyone expects, um, you to have some type of prerequisite to, to be a contributor. I think people really just care about if you're passionate and if you're interested, you know, uh, if you have curiosity, people will help, you know, feel that and, and give you the information you need and help, you know, facilitate your uh, growth as a contributor. Also, you know, again, it's an inclusive community. Everyone's really welcoming. Um, I, I feel like I keep repeating this, but like for me, it has been a really great experience. I think that, you know, being a contributor to, contributor to Kubernetes has definitely helped my career and helped me grow more and more, um, you know, in both career and personal growth. Uh, like for example, this is my first webinar and you know, I was reached out uh, to by someone at my company. They said, hey, Jeremy, I know you're, um, you know, been contributing to Kubernetes and, you know, you have a cool journey, maybe you can share it. And the point is, you know, I, I think, opportunities like this keep coming up. And for me, it has always been related to Kubernetes. So I think that's just a good sign that, uh, you know, they are interested in, you know, not only having you contribute, but helping you grow yourself as well. And then, um, you know, you also get to develop friendships and, uh, you know, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good things in terms of like experience, you know, like we're going to the conferences, um, pairing on, you know, code, uh, these things are, you know, pretty fun and kind of keeps me involved and I look forward to working with different people within the community. Um, yeah, so there's also uh, my links for Twitter. So Morrisland 93, my LinkedIn is Jeremy L. Morris. You can go to my personal website, jeremylmorris.com. And I've also included uh, links for some of the things I talked about in terms of the projects, uh, a link on how you can make a PR and how to like get feedback on it, uh, the diversity scholarship link, and then also information on the testing related stuff I was talking about earlier. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming to my webinar, and I hope you were able to learn how you can be a contributor too. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for that wonderful presentation. We have plenty of time for questions, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. question here that says, could you please paste the link here? Um, and Nahari, and I don't know what uh, link you're referring to. Could you be a little more specific? Um, there's a question here. Uh, any recommendations on local tools? Um, 
like development tools like like IDE and things like that? Um, um, it says local tools. It's okay. Yeah, so I use uh, VS Code, and I found it easier to use um, like a droplet to have all my. Uh, so basically, I use VS Code to remote uh, SSH. Uh, into a droplet, a DigitalOcean droplet, and that's how it would contribute. So that you know, the droplet would always be there, and it wouldn't matter what computer I was using. And I could just use uh, VS Code SSH into that. Excellent. Um, we have, are there any other questions at all? Just a further reminder to everyone again that uh, the presentation links will uh, the presentation from today's webinar will be available on the CNCF webinar after the presentation is concluded. So we'll have it up shortly later today. Uh, if anyone has any other questions at all, please feel free to drop one into the Q&A box. What is your uh, yeah. background? Oh, I'm you sorry. see it. Should we repeat uh, these so that everyone can hear it? Do they see Absolutely. these? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what is your background in software engineering infrastructure? Yeah, so my background in software engineering is uh, I, I got a degree in computer science, uh, graduated in like winter 2016 and got my first job uh, at Raytheon, where my first experience with Kubernetes was uh, I had to write a trade study on like what a good container orchestrator and container runtime environment solution would be for our needs. Um, so yeah, mostly uh, software engineering experience and infrastructure wise, uh, I'll use Kubernetes here and there until finally uh, getting to join the DigitalOcean uh, Kubernetes team and working on that. Well, Do you recommend questions? Yeah, we'll get to them. Do you yeah. recommend contributing to Kubernetes or any other related projects? Uh, yes, I, I do recommend contributing to Kubernetes. I think that's you know, a really good experience. You learn a lot. And then also any of the projects within the Kubernetes organization or the Kubernetes SIGS uh, organization. Do you, do you have any tips on how to get from scratch to a dev and test environment? Um, I, I think the question is asking like, how do you go from not having this stuff set up to being able to, you know, I guess work on it uh, locally. I think, um, yeah, just, you know, look up tutorials on how you set up VS Code uh, and, you know, Go, you need to have Go installed. And then Kubernetes has uh, some good documentation on how to uh, get set up. I think if you look at any of the projects, there's a contributing.md file. I would definitely follow that to figure out how to get started. Do you like any other cloud native tools? Um, can't necessarily think of anything off the top of my head, but I'm sure I, I use a bunch of other things. Does the contribution to Kubernetes require a wide expertise in development? Um, I don't think so. No, I think a lot of, I, I remember there was quite a few contributors who contributed a lot and they were you know, just starting out or in high school or something. So I think that Kubernetes tries to provide a lot of documentation, how to get ramped up, uh, even if they, you know, they will, they might assume that you're starting from scratch too. There's documentation for that as well. So there's no assumption that you have like tremendous experience developing software. Uh, assumption is that you just want to get started and then they have, you know, different documentation to address different needs. What are the VS Code plugins that you're suggesting? I think it's, uh, there's like an SSH or remote SSH extension. Um, usually in VS Code, you can just, you know, search SSH. I think it's like one of the top ones, but I don't know off the top of my head. What software language do we have to learn um, to contribute to K8s? Uh, mainly Go. Um, a lot of the stuff that you'll see is Go. But there's also, I know that website project that I linked, that's in HTML. So there's, there's different languages, but I think if you learn Go, you'll be pretty well suited to uh, work on a majority of the things. 
Do we have any other questions at all? problem. Plenty of time for questions, folks. Please feel free to drop in anything in the Q&A box. Like uh, we got another question. Which site do you recommend for language? Um, so for like the for for GoLang, I'd recommend the canonical. So let me just Google real quick what that is. There's a, a they just GoLang.org. I'd recommend that to start off with. Um, I think you know typically when I would talk to people about learning Go or when I was first learning it, that's always the you know, the site I get pointed to, the actual, you know, the canonical one. So I'll start off with that, golang.org. Okay. You have anybody else at all? Okay, yeah, well, if no one has any other questions, we'll um, call this a day. I want to thank Jeremy again for a wonderful presentation. Oh, wait, we have one more question here. Is there a way to validate my code before submitting a PR? Any tools available? Yeah, uh, so I added some links, but there's the, the hack E2E directory, which has uh, some stuff you can run in terms of like scripts, like a bash script. And then there's also, uh, you know, there's some, I, I think, I think mainly looking at those links and then also just looking at uh, some of the documentation and reaching out to the SIG testing channel. Again, everyone does things differently. Um, there's even, you know, you can utilize like Minikube and, and things like that to, you know, test things uh, locally before you push it up. Um, in terms of running the, like the actual like CI tests, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how you can try to replicate that or if you can, um, but yeah, I would look at the documentation or consult with the uh, SIG testing uh, stock channel. Okay. Do you have any further questions at all?
Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, I think we'll call it a day. I want to thank Jeremy again for a great presentation and thank everyone for attending. As I said before, we'll have the recording and slides from today on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Thank you all for attending and everyone take care, stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone.